morning everyone so here is my first lecture on the topic that is optical communication and we are going to deliver this topic that is optical fiber link and ray transmission theory so basically optical communication before we have already studied about analog communication and digital communication parts so in analog and digital communication we basically use coaxial cables but in optical communication we use as a medium as optical fiber so the transmitter and the receiver part are same more or less uh, as in the case of the analog and digital communication but in optical communication we have different uh, transmitter and receiver so in the place of transmitter we use here leds and lasers which are basically light sources and in the detectors we use here detectors like photodiodes or pin or avalanche type of photodiode so here we are going in the first lecture we see we will see the basics of optical fiber link and how this optical fiber link will work uh, as a ray in uh, transmission of light from transmitter to receiver. So here we are going to cover these topics that is brief history of the optical fiber communication, introduction to fiber optics, block diagram of optical fiber link, advantages and applications. Then we will see the ray theory transmission process which is total internal reflection and Snell's law. So, if we are talking about the optical fiber, we can say that optical fiber is nothing as a, it is same as a medium like coaxial cable, but it has many advantages. It has many uh, advantages like tremendous bandwidth that is 10 to the power 13 to 10 to the power 14 hertz and it has uh, flexibility. We can mold or we can um, bend the fiber as we require in the under, under the earth or wherever we want to lay down the fibers, we can easily bend it out. So, before uh, coming out into the into these details of optical fiber from where the optical fiber are coming uh, from first generation to fourth generation we have categorized here optical fiber so in the first generation what will happen in the first generation we have the optical fiber which will be working nearly in the 800 nanometer range so these are some there are some wavelengths which are very important in the optical communication that is 800 nanometer 1310 nanometer and 1550 nanometer. So, in these wavelengths, basically these wavelengths are the three windows of the optical fiber or we, whatever uh, laser we are going to use with the um, optical fiber, we can use the laser at 800 nanometer, at 1310 nanometer or at 1550 nanometer. So, we can see here that the first generation is operating near 800 nanometer and here we use the semiconductor's laser which is made up of gallium arsenide which is a compound that is made up of gallium and arsenide third and fifth group element commercially available in 1980s it is uh, basically the available in 1980s and it is operated at a bit rate of 45 mbps which is very less and repeater spacing of about 10 kilometers larger as, as compared to that of coaxial cable even if we use coaxial cable in place of uh, fiber we have to use the repeaters uh, at a distance of around 2 to 3 kilometers at every 2 to 3 kilometers we have to use the repeaters to gain the uh, level of the signal but in the case of the optical fiber we can see here if we are operating at nearly at 800 nanometer with gallium arsenide semiconductor lasers we have a repeater spacing of around 10 kilometers which is larger as compared to that of the coaxial cable which which we use in analog and digital communication the second one is the second generation uh, optical fibers so it's operate near 1300 nanometer we can say it is around 1310 nanometer where fiber loss is very less which is 1 db per kilometer typically it is 0.5 db per kilometer loss is very important factor uh, when we design a link a fiber optic link between the transmitter and the receiver we have to see that the losses should be less so uh, if we operate near 1300 nanometer the fiber losses are, are around 1 db per kilometer or nearly 0.5 db per kilometer and the fiber exhibits some dispersion which is very minimum and these dip dispersion can be compensated through dispersion compensating fiber that is called as dcf so here in the second generation we can use the compound like this indium gallium arsenide phosphide which is a quaternary compound so, the fraction of the indium we can take x, gallium as 1 minus x and arsenide as y and phosphorus as 1 minus y. So, these type of semiconductors, lasers and detectors are can be used in second generation and it is available in early 80s. 
so by 1987 commercially available systems were operating at a bit rate of around 1.7 gbps which is very high as compared to 45 mbps which we have we have used in first generation uh, optical fiber and repeater spacing is also increased around 50 km as compared to 10 km of repeater spacing in the case of first generation so if we compare the first and second generation obviously the second generation optical fibers are much more uh, efficient as compared to the first generation network first generation optical fiber systems so we if we come about third generation fiber has minimum loss at 1550 <coughs> nanometer realized in 1979 but dispersion was considerably large so at 1550 nanometer the losses are very less but dispersion was there so we can easily compensate these dispersion through dispersion compensating fibers so it displayed more dispersion around 1550 nanometer so we can use two types of special fibers are we can use that is dispersion shifted fibers first one and the dispersion compensating fibers so these dispersion problems can be overcome with these type of fibers which will be designed around uh, 1550 nanometer and they will nullified all the dispersion coming at 1550 nanometer so in 1990s commercially available systems were operating at 2.5 gbps and it is capable of operating at <coughs> 10 gbps so dsf that is dispersion shifted fibers with single longitudinal mode lasers we will discuss it in the later case that how the lasers will be worked how the lasers have the modes the single longitudinal modes will be in lasers or multiple modes in lasers how we select only one mode in the laser so typical uh, repeater spacing is around 60 to 70 km as compared to second generation it is high in the second generation we have 50 km repeater spacing in the third generation we have 60 to 70 km repeater spacing so if we uh, simulate both the things that is at 1310 nanometer the laser is working and at 1550 nanometer laser is working so at 1550 nanometer we have very less loss but there is some dispersion which can be compensated through dispersion compensated fiber but in the case of 1310 nanometer we have very less loss but uh, usually have some minor dispersion so we can uh, easily compensate that dispersion also so but that is called as zero material dispersion at 1310 nanometer so at 1310 nanometer this wavelength is particularly is called as zero material dispersion but it has very high losses so at 1310 loss is very high and at 1550 loss is very less so that's why we if we simulate both the things we will find out better results in the case of the 1550 nanometer as compared to 1310 nanometer in the case of the fourth generation a drawback of third generation that is 1.55 micrometer of 1550 nanometer the signal is regenerated periodically by using electronic repeater the fourth generation makes use of optical amplifiers here we can use easily atfa that is rbm do fiber amplifier in the year 1989 we have used for increasing the repeater spacing and wdm for increasing the bit rate so in the fourth generation the wdm that is wavelength division multiplexing concept will came and uh, for increasing the bit rate beyond gbps at higher gbps around 10 gbps we can use easily wdm so it employs rbm do fiber amplifiers at 1990 it has been used and the repeater spacing has been increased from 60 to 100 km apart so we we will reach uh, at the repeater spacing of around 100 km Uh, in the fourth generation so several wdm systems were deployed across the atlantic and pacific oceans during 1998 to 2001 in response to the internet redu induced increase in the data traffic they have increased the total capacity by orders of magnitude so with the help with this generation we can easily see that um, by using the rbm do fiber amplifiers we have increased the repeater spacing So now coming to optical fiber what is optical fiber it's a long cylindrical dielectric waveguide usually of circular cross section transparent to light over the operating wavelength so here we have a very important thing that the wavelength of the light which we are using are with, compatible with the fiber or not so in the diagram we can see that there is a core and a cladding above that the core has a refractive index of n1 the cladding has a refractive index of n2 and above the cladding there is a buffer coating 
So the inner layer core of radius A and refractive index N1 and the outer layer is cladding has refractive index N2. Here the necessary condition is N1 should be greater than N2. The refractive index of the core should be must be greater than uh, the refractive index of the cladding for the TIR that is total internal reflection which is very important phenomena in the case of the uh, optical fiber. So, we can see that the light propagation through optical fiber in from the uh, when the light is hit from the air to the core at the axis of the core the light will get totally internally reflected inside the core. So, there are some lights maybe they will radiate through the uh, uh, core cladding interface only th um, those lights are radiated through the core cladding interface which are not incident at a particular angle. So, that angle we will discuss later here. So, no light lost cladding allows complete total internal reflection if the if the angle of the incidence is uh, in between that particular angle that is below uh, between the or uh, below the maximum angle which we can see, uh, say that it is called as acceptance angle. So, the, that the acceptance angle to be the maximum angle at which the light is to be falling uh, at the core axis. So, only in that case the total internal reflection will get to happen otherwise the light will get uh, radiated. Uh, as radiation through the core cladding interface. So, here there is a diagram showing light propagation through fiber the conditions for total internal reflection should be met at the core cladding interface. Some lights are falling at the core cladding interface, but they will move towards the cladding interface and they will eventually loss through radiation, but some of the lights will travel through core cladding interface and they will get hit it at the core cladding interface and they will follow the total internal reflection phenomena. So, by this way we can see that not all the lights are entering at the core clad, uh, core axis will um, come out to be as a total internally reflected ray inside the fiber. Maybe there are some lights which will get uh, radiated through the through radiation. So, these are some lights which get radiated through cladding. So, what is the need for a fiber optic communication? So, in long haul transmission there is a need of long low loss transmission medium, there is a need of compact and least weight transmitters and receiver, there is a need of increased span of transmission. So, which, which is possible only in the case of the uh, optical fiber, it, it is not possible in the case of the uh, coaxial cable, there is a need of increased bitrate distance product. So, as we have already discussed in the generations part that uh, in the fourth generation we will reach at the highest of the Gbps that is around 10 Gbps or 15 Gbps. So, as we increase the bit rate obviously the data which we are transmitting from the transmitter to receiver will get deteriorated. So, we have to see the data will not be being get deteriorated and the bit rate should be also high. So, the bit rate distance product is also a major concern of the uh, particularly communication system which we are establishing through fiber from transmitter to receiver. So, next we will discuss about how the block diagram of OFC system will, uh, will be working. So, as we have already discussed in analog and digital communication there are three main blocks of the um, block diagram that is first one is the transmitter, the second is the uh, channel and the third part is the receiver. In the same way we have categorized here that is the first part is the transmitter, the second part is the your channel which is optical fiber and the third part is receiver. So, from the message origin we have a modulator. So, here we use generally in the case of the fiber optic OOK modulation that is on off keying modulation. So, in the case uh, we have maybe we have a message with in the form of the text in the form of a data video or something else. So, firstly we have to convert that, that message into an electrical form and then electrical message will be converted through light with the help of the some modulator or the or the laser driver or the carrier driver. So, we here we have a on off keying modulation the carrier source will be a laser or LED we can use both the laser or LED then there is a channel coupler which couples all the light from the transmitter to the uh, channel which is basically your uh, optical fiber. So, it the channel coupler has a role of coupling the light from the transmitter end to the optical fiber. 
Then we have repeaters in between the optical fibers. Obviously, we have seen that around 100 kilometer apart, we can use repeaters. So, after the repeater, we have an optical detector. So, here what we are processing in the, at the transmitter end from the electrical signal, we are converting that electrical signal into a light signal or an optical signal with the help of the carrier source and the modulator and that optical signal will be then sent to optical fiber and then at the other end, the optical detector receive that optical signal, convert back into that optical signal into electrical signal. So, from here, we are getting our electrical signal. From carrier source, we have optical signal. So, here from the optical detector, we are getting electrical signal. Then the pre post processing things like amplification or filtration, we can uh, use here with the help of the amplifier and the processing. And we will get our original message which we are taking from the input side the same message we are getting at the destination. So, this is basic block diagram of OFC system which is more or less are similar to uh, digital and log communication. Instead of we are using <coughs> in the case of analog and digital, we have some other sources. Here we are using lasers as a carrier source and as a detector we can use pin or avalanche photodiodes. So, there is a summary of this particular block diagram that is the modulator converts the electrical message into, into the proper format. It impresses the signal onto the wave generated by carrier source. The carrier source, it generates the wave on which the information is transmitted. The wave is called carrier. The channel coupler, it feeds the power into the information channel which is your optical fiber and the channel coupler design is an important part of the fiber system because of the possibility of high losses. And the optical detector, it converts the optical signal back into electrical signal. After that, the amplifier and processing will work. So, after receiving the electrical signal, further amplification and filtering will be done to get the desired output message signal, which is your same as the origin, original message. So, next we have transmission sequence. So, information is encoded into electrical signals. Electrical signals are converted into light signals through optical source and driver. Light travels to the fiber, the fiber can be single uh, mod mode fiber or multi mode fiber we can use. The detector converts the light back into the electrical signal. Electrical signals are decoded into the form of the information. So, this is all about the block diagram of the optical fiber communication system. Now, we have optical spectral band. So, we have categorized here uh, some bands like O band, E band, S band, C band, L band, U band. And we have the particular wavelengths for these bands that is from for O band it is 1260 to 1360 nanometer. For E band it is called as extended which is 1360 to 1460. S band short band which is 1460 to 1530. C band conventional band where ETFI is used or uh, WDM will work is 1530 to 1565. Then L band it is 1565 to 1625. And then U band which is ultra long band which is 1625 to 1675 nanometers. So, here the O band was the original first uh, region used for single mode fiber links. Links can be extended into E band region for fibers with low water content. We have hydroxyl, it can be a hydroxyl oil, uh, oil content in the fiber. So, the S band consists of uh, wavelengths shorter than C band and then E band, but higher than E band. C band is the wavelength used for conventional erbium dope fiber. So, here we use ETFA in the C band, L band is longer than C band. In this longer band, the gain decreases steadily to 1 at 1625 nanometer and U band is the region beyond the response capability of an ADFA. So, basically we use C band here which is around 14, 1530 to 1565 nanometer which is used also for WDM wavelength division multiplexing. So, this is the spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum of the uh, lights. And here we have the frequency range and the wavelength range. We can see that the wavelength is in the range of nanometer and the frequency is in the range of the terahertz for the optical uh, communication uh, transmission or the laser communication that is around 10 to the power 13 to 10 to the power 14 hertz. 
so it is also called as infrared region so we have power and telephone radio waves then microwaves then infrared then ultraviolet so this is the as the uh, wavelength will frequency will increase wavelength will keeps on decreasing so the wavelengths are very less in the case of the optical fiber communication that is around nanometers and we have already discussed the three wavelengths which is 800 nanometer 1310 nanometer and 1550 nanometer so what are the advantages we have already discussed some of the advantages that it has uh, large potential bandwidth around 10 power 13 to 10 power 16 terahertz it has small weight and size it it is the diameter of the fiber is uh, similar to human hair electrical isolation it is basically it is fabricated from glass that's why it is very isolated uh, there is no conductivity immunity to interference and crosstalk as it is uh, very immune to electromagnetic interference so the operation here in the uh, case of the optical fiber is much more simpler as compared to the coaxial cable signal security the light from optical fibers does not uh, radiate significantly and therefore they provide a high degree of signal security low transmission loss around 0.2 dB per kilometer there is a loss system reliability and ease of maintenance so low loss property of optical fiber cables reduce the requirement for intermediate repeaters which we use in coaxial cables at a distance of 2 to 3 kilometers roughness and flexibility optical fibers have a very high tensile strength that's why it is very easily twisted and lay down inside the uh, earth easily low cost and availability as it is available in abundance it is made up of silica so that's why it has very low cost and its availability is very easy next we have applications of optical fiber so the it, it have some uh, major applications like military applications medical applications undersea cables we can at undersea cables we can use optical fibers control systems we can use factory communications railways in the form of the signaling communication networks we can use optical fibers so there are a lot of applications where optical fibers are used next we discuss the ray theory transmission part so from here we just see because fiber has both the parts that is ray theory and the mode theory so at the start we are discussing here the snell's law so what is snell's law says uh, snell's law is basically a uh, interface between two dielectric medium which has a refractive index of n1 and n2 the light is falling at the denser medium at an angle theta 1 and it is refracted away from the normal at an angle theta 2 so we have a relation here that is n1 sin theta 1 is equal to n2 sin theta 2 so this is a relation which shows that the light will fall from one medium to another and it is refracted away this medium is obviously denser medium and this is rare or we can write sin theta 1 upon sin theta 2 is equal to n2 by n1 so this relation is for holds for snell's law here the major important is uh, is thing the thing is that is n1 should be greater than n2 the refractive index of the uh, uh, medium at which the light is incident must be greater than the refractive index of the medium at which the light is refracted away from the normal also the theta angle that that is theta 1 is must be less than theta 2 so we will discuss here the principle of light propagation through tr through the fiber which is basically total internal reflection so when the light rays incident on the interface between the two mediums having different indices at an angle great, greater than critical angle the lights gets totally internally reflected within the medium of high refractive index so we can see from the three figures here at the in the first figure the light is incident from an at an angle theta 1 uh, into the denser medium and it will be refracted away from the normal into the rarer medium there is some partial reflection obviously at an angle theta 1 in, into the originating medium when we increase the angle theta 1 to theta c which is your critical angle the light gets uh, reflect refracted away from the normal and it will be parallel to the interface between the two mediums that is n1 and n2 at this at this stage the theta 2 angle is 90 degree so here that angle theta 2 is 90 degree and the relation which is which we have found that is n2 by n1 is equal to sin theta 1 upon sin theta 2 by snell's law now it becomes n2 by n1 and sin theta 1 becomes theta c and sin theta 2 becomes sin 90 degree which is 1 so here theta c or phi c we can denote 
critical angle is equal to sin inverse n2 by n1. So, by this way we can calculate the value of the critical angle. As we increase the angle beyond the critical angle that is theta c, we will see that the, tot the light will get totally internally reflected into the same medium which is your originating medium. So, these three stages will show you that how the light will uh, travel inside the fiber. The same Snell's law will be applicable in the fiber because the fiber construction or the fabrication is a similar thing that is it has a core of higher refractive index and a cladding of uh, outer cladding of lower refractive index. The light falls on the core axis obviously at the uh, denser medium and it will get reflected or refracted away from the uh, normal to the rarer medium. So, if we if it hits the light, the light will hits at the fiber axis at an angle critical angle, it will get parallel to the interface. If it hits at an angle greater than critical angle, it will get back reflected into the same medium or the core. So, that is how the this Snell's law and the TIR principle will get related to the optical fiber also. So, here there are some uh, terminology which we have uh, shown here that the refractive index, the refractive index of the medium is defined as the ratio of light velocity of light in vacuum to the velocity of light in medium. The propagation of light within an optical fiber is explained through ray theory model as follows. A ray of light travels more slowly in optically dense medium than in one which is less dense. That is why the light gets refracted away from the normal. When a ray is incident at an angle theta 1 normal at the surface of the interface between two dielectrics of different indices, suppose we are taking indices, uh, different uh, refractive index like glass and air. So, in that case the light will get incident at an angle of theta 1 to the glass and it will get refracted away from the normal in the uh, next uh, refractive index which is your air. So, that reflection occurs. So, if the angle of incidence is greater than uh, theta c or phi c, obviously the total internal reflection will get happen in the fiber. So, if the dielectric on the other side of the uh, interface has the refractive index n2 which is less than n1, then the reflection is such that the ray path in this index medium is at an angle theta 2 to the normal where theta 2 must be greater than uh, theta 1. The angle of incidence theta 1 and theta 2 are related to each other with the help of the Snell's law which is sin theta 1 is equal to n2 sin theta 2. So, n1 sin theta 1 is equal to n2 sin theta 2 or we can write sin theta 1 upon sin theta 2 is equal to n2 by n1. When the angle of refraction is 90 degree the and the refracted ray emerges parallel to the interface between the dielectrics, the angle of incidence must be less than 90 degree. So, which is same as obviously it, it should be must less than 90 degree, but at an angle theta c that is why only only in that case the angle of refraction becomes 90 degree that that means theta 2 becomes 90 degree. This is the limiting case of the refraction and the angle of incidence in that case is known as your critical angle which is represented here as phi c. At an angle of incidence greater than the critical angle the light gets reflected back into the originating dielectric medium which is of refractive index n1 with high efficiency this phenomena is known as total internal reflection. So, this phenomena is the same phenomena which will happen in the fiber also the Snell's law will be applicable to the fiber also that is why we have to read this also uh, in the earlier stage that how the light will follow the total internal reflection phenomena inside the fiber. So, thank you so much in the next lecture we will discuss about how the what are the different types of fibers, how they the light will travel inside these fibers, what are the different parameters associated with these fibers. So, thank you so much.